Hello, everyone. We want to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Health and Human Rights Institute of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. This is the fourth installment of the Health and Human Rights Institute's web, web series devoted to addressing mental health disparities. Today, we will be discussing trauma-informed care relating to gender and intersectionality violence, and we have an engaging presentation planned for you. This virtual series is made possible through the generous sponsorship of the National Black Talk Association for Education and Talent Development. My name is Maya Watson, and I bring you greetings on behalf of the Health and Human Rights Institute. We wanna thank you all for being here today as we know that hearts may be heavy across this nation now for several different reasons. Before we begin, we must acknowledge that we are on the hills of a weekend filled with protests and unrest following the brutal murder of yet another unarmed black man. 117 years ago, intellectual and scholar W.E.B. Du Bois wrote that this nation has not yet found peace from its sins and the freed man has, ne has not yet found freedom in his promised land. Over a century later, this statement remains true. Violence against Blacks by government actors and police has existed long before technology and cameras were able to capture it. This violence is rooted in a system that is systemic racism and oppression that has plagued this country from its very inception. The Black community and others have been weary for a long time as this violence often results in only few arrests and convictions of police officers. Fatigue from this oppression was addressed in our April 20th web webinar entitled The Toll of White Supremacy on Mental Health. We encourage you to watch it on our website and to pass the video along to your friends and loved ones. In order to stop the senseless killing and make democracy more than a mere illusion, each of us, the privileged elite and the marginalized, must work to ensure that excessive force is unacceptable in our communities, to bring those who engage in such excessive force to justice, to make politicians and leaders who stoke the flames of racism and hate accountable for their words, and to hold the human rights of all people as sacred. With that being said, I would like to welcome each of you today, and we hope that you are doing well at this time. Uh, we would like to clarify that the thoughts and ideas expressed today are those of each individual. They do not reflect the views of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, nor any of its agents, employees, or components. We invite our attendees to ask questions through the Q&A link option on Zoom, and then we will pose those questions to our panelists during our question and answer period at the end of this event. This is Mental Health Awareness Month, and we will be discussing how trauma resulting from violent experiences are implicated in behavioral health disorders. To aid us in this discussion, we have a great panel lined up. Serving as our facilitator will be Dr. Da will be Dr. Dabney Evans. Dabney is the Associate Professor of Global Health in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. She is also an advisory board member to our Health and Human Rights Institute, and she will introduce the rest of the panelists. Dabney, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, like everyone else, I have a heavy heart and my, my brain and my heart is also filled with righteous outrage as uh, are all of you. I wanted to share a little bit of art from my neighborhood that I came across this weekend, which was a sidewalk tribute to, um, to those that have been senselessly murdered at the hands of police, with police violence and police brutality, and to recognize that this is a trauma, as Maya mentioned, a trauma particularly for our communities, our black and brown communities, and one that is perpetuated by systems of power, including white supremacy and, um, and hegemonic powers and patriarchy. So I want us to remember today, as we open up our conversation about trauma-informed care and gender-based violence, that we mourn the deaths not only of George Floyd and Tony McDade and Ahmaud Arbery here in our own state of Georgia, but also our sisters who are sometimes forgotten in, in this war, um, including Breonna Taylor and so many others whose names we must say and we must demand justice for during this time. So let me try and get my technology. 
circling here. And if you could share the screen again, Maya, for the other presentation. Thank you. And next slide, please. So I'm going to briefly introduce each of our panelists and uh, they may as well invite their own remarks related to the events of the past week and this weekend in particular as they give their presentations. Um, we want to allow space for everyone to um, feel their feelings, whatever they may be in this, in this difficult moment. And also as we look together to constructive ways in which we can address the collective trauma and the collective violence that has been faced by, by our communities, our black and brown communities in particular. So this panel will be focused on gender-based violence and intersectional violence. And the term intersectionality, of course, coined by scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who pointed out the ways in which different forms of marginalization or different identities may be particularly vulnerable to violence and to trauma. So each of our esteemed panelists brings a different perspective about the particular populations that they work with. And we'll be hearing a lot from them about what we can do collectively and individually to address trauma through trauma-informed care and, and particular with a particular attention to gender. So our first panelist is Dr. Keisha Holden. She is the Endowed Chair in Mental Health and Director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. Next slide. Our next panelist will be Darlene Lynch, who is the Head of External Relations at the Center for Victims of Torture in Atlanta. And she'll be bringing a little bit of her international perspective to us, including our international community members here in Atlanta. Our next panelist will be uh, Tamar Azar, who is Associate Director and Lecturer in Law at the Human Rights Clinic at the University of Miami School of Law. And then our final panelist is Jennifer Swain. Oh, excuse me, we've got one more. Jennifer Swain, Executive Director of Youth Spark, who's here in Atlanta focusing on addressing the issue of human trafficking. And then our final panelist, last but not least, Charnel Miles, who's founder and executive director of Joyous Beginnings Child and Family Wellness Center and the Trauma Resource Institute. So please join me in welcoming each of our panelists. And I'll turn it over now to Dr. Holden to begin our presentations. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I, I too want to echo the sentiments of Dabney and, and Maya concerning the state of where we are in our nation today as it relates to um, anti, uh, ra racism, systemic racism, um, anti-violence initiatives and protests that are happening across the country. Um, I am really, I think it's very timely that we're having this discussion around trauma and how to support those around coping with trauma. Um, given the context of what we're dealing with nationally and certainly in various communities um, locally and across uh, various ways in which we interact with family members and friends. I'm a psychologist and the associate director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute and I primarily focus on looking at ways in which we can support individuals, Black women in particular, who are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, and other ways of coping, but more from a strengths-based perspective. And so I'm just gonna share with you today a little bit about a project that, I, that we have ongoing at Morehouse School of Medicine that is really around resilience and how to build African-American women who have been impacted by post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And so it's entitled Building Biobehavioral um, Goal-Directed Resilience Training Among Black Women or African-American Women. It's the NIH-funded study and it's ongoing. Um, and it's a really collaboration between the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine within Morehouse School of Medicine. And um, these are the faces of many Black women that some are smiling, some are not. Um, but I just want to reemphasize that there's a, a chronic pain that many women go through 
And black women also go through that from more of a chronic perspective. So it's not isolated stressors that may happen, um, but a constellation of psychosocial triggers uh, that are apparent just in daily life, some of which we have heard about. Um, but this project is really about how to respond to those who have experienced post-traumatic, or at least have some symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And just to give you a little background about post PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's centered around, it's a psychiatric condition that is really um, about how people react to from a psychological, physical, and mental perspective um, as it relates to trauma. It's really characterized by how emotionally they may integrate um, stress or stressors that they've experienced in various ways um, to being able to deal with or cope with different situations in their everyday lives, uh, function in their everyday lives. And it is, it's really, a, 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 again, a negative perception of highly stressful or traumatic experiences that a person may undergo whether it be in childhood, adolescence, and or adulthood. And when, when you think about um, PTSD for black women, um, it's even more deleterious. Um, generally in our nation, um, about 70% of people are adult um, experience PTSD, PTSD for, but for women, it's even more. Um, 10 to 12 percent of women are associated with high rates of PTSD and for black women um, that number grows even higher and so we our team which really includes a, a diverse team of individuals at Morehouse School of Medicine at Emory University at Brady Hospital they have a trauma project um, and it, we're looking at ways in which we can help to reshape the narrative around how to respond to some of the symptoms of PTSD. Next. Okay. And so the overall project goal that we have is uh, wanting to look at ways in which we can implement a skills training or skills based, resilient skills based intervention to help women deal with better um, uh, PTSD or symptoms of PTSD. And so it's really about how to address some of the trauma-informed ways in which individuals, women, Black women may respond to or deal with um, their experiences of trauma. And so we want to look at how we can be effective in implementing more of a culturally centered, gender-specific intervention um, for these women and look at some of the physiological um, outcomes, whether it be sleep, how their heart, may, heart rates may change and how they respond to the trauma that they experience. But it's really about also reshaping the way in which they think about or respond to how they're going to operate a function in various aspects of their life. And so the intervention group will include six, six sessions, um, but all of the sessions are around how to support these individuals with um, skills around resilience building or goal-directed resilience building. And we'll measure the changes that happen with these individuals, these women, and their overall health and wellness. Okay, as I mentioned, one, one thing I do want to acknowledge is that Morehouse School of Medicine has a strong community-based or community-engaged approach to working with, connecting with, um, being uh, in relation with others. Um, and so we, want, we go into communities and try to at least get as much information as possible about how to response specifically to them. And so our approach is really looking at how we can tailor our intervention um, such that the curriculum that we're using, we 
made it a little more culturally sensitive, culturally responsive, um, and such that when we teach them or train them around goal-directed resilient skills, that we'll be able to help them to, one, as I mentioned, cope better, but also function better, but also um, be able to uh, respond in a way that's going to be healthier for them in, in their lives. And so overall, we're looking to uh, really impact the community, support individuals in the community, have women such that they are able to connect with care, mental health care in particular, um, and in a primary care setting. Because one thing that I know, um, and many of you may be aware of, is that many ethnic minorities may not go to a specialty appointment um, or referral, uh, they may actually use their primary care center if they have a doctor, a uh, primary care doctor to connect them with mental health services or at least to be the, the first step towards screening for different ways in which they may need to uh, connect with a provider who can provide mental health services. And so we want to encourage their participation in care, um, overall health care, mental health care, and also how integrated care it can be advantageous to everyone's experience overall. Um, Dr. Satcher, who is our Surgeon General, 16th Sur Surgeon General, former Surgeon General, he one, one statement he has made often is that there is no help without mental health. And this is understanding that there's a true integration between how we um, look at our overall health and mental health is a part of it. So uh, traditionally or historically, mental health has been separated from someone's general physical health. And so we need to begin to um, see how those work together uh, stimulously, really, um, to understand that there really is no help without mental health. And so I, I only have five minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But I, of course, I want to respond to any questions um, towards the end that anyone has. Thank you so much, Keisha, for bringing that important perspective. And, and you are completely right, and Dr. Satcher completely right. There is no health without mental health. I'm sure that we'll have many questions about the ways in which we can bring mental health and trauma-informed care into primary care and prevention in public health spaces. So again, we invite people to type their questions into the Q&A so that we can have a lively discussion with each of our panelists as we, uh, after we hear their remarks. So we'll now we'll move on to Darlene. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be here and, as Dabney said, to bring an international perspective. Um, over the past week and the past weekend, uh, I've been thinking a lot about our clients at CBT. And at CBT, we serve survivors of torture from all parts of the world and many from African nations. And, um, you know, in, in those countries, in many countries, they, people are coming here because they see the United States as a refuge, as a place that um, can be peaceful, um, as a place that respects each other. And it, it is heartbreaking to me that we fall short of that and how devastating it must be to our clients uh, to be witnessing sort of our failures and our weaknesses right now. And, um, so my heart really goes out to them, and I, and I will talk a little bit about intersectionality, about how, how our clients are coping with fear, discrimination, and violence at different levels um, once they come to the United States. So CBT is started as a human rights initiative um, because the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights very clearly states that Torture is a violation of every human being's human right. Um, today, CBT is the world's largest treatment and advocacy organization. And so we are very much a, men, uh, a health and legal partnership. And our goal is that we can end torture so that there's no longer any need 
for our services to care and rehabilitate survivors. So we now work in all parts of the world. Um, as I mentioned, we are in um, several parts of Africa, but also in Jordan and also in Minnesota is where we're founded. And then you can see the small center that we now have in Atlanta. And we started in Atlanta just a few years ago. Um, and we, we do a lot of what Dr. Holden uh, discussed. We are interdisciplinary service provider where we have psychotherapists, we have social workers, case managers, professional interpreters, in-person interpreters, and we provide holistic and um, culturally adapted and trauma-informed care to each and every one of our clients, no matter where they come from in the world. So, you know, a lot of folks in the United States don't know what torture really is. Um, and what we define it as in, at CBT is it's a deliberate and systematic dismantling of a person's identity and humanity through physical or psychological pain and suffering. Um, it's not intended to seek out information or any other purpose as a, as a, a method of uh, national security or anything. It is a method of destroying human beings. And it is a violation under US law, under international law, and a violation of human rights. And um, in context of this summit, not only are there, are, does each human being have a human right to health, but you have a human right to live free from torture under a separate convention, the UN Convention Against Torture and Cruel and Inhuman and Degrading Treatment and a separate right to rehabilitation if you are subjected to that. So who and why uh, uh, is affected by torture in the world today? And really it's everybody. Uh, you know, there are no, there's no one profile. It's men, women, and children. Um, at CBT here in Georgia and in over, internationally, about 50% of our clients are women or girls. And um, sadly, at some of our CBT, C, CBT centers overseas, very large proportion of our, our survivors are children, either children who witnessed the torture of their parents or children who were tortured themselves in order to get to their parents or to, to harm their families and communities. And our clients are targeted for a variety of reasons. Uh, they're targeted because of their religion, because of the part of the country that they come from, from their ethnicity, um, or because they are speaking out uh, for democracy or against corruption or, or for their right to practice their religion in their country. Uh, a huge variety of reasons calls them to the attention of political authorities and of police and causes them to be targeted for torture. Um, and you know it impacts the whole family and community. When your family member is tortured, your family learns to become silent. And when you have a second person who's tortured, the community learns to be silent. And, and so at CBT, we say that torture is effective at, at one very important thing. It creates a climate of fear that tears about apart communities and destroys civic engagement. And when I read this today, I couldn't help but think how similar that is in a lot of our communities here in the United States, that the fear of authorities, of corrupt authorities and violent authorities can really diminish our communities, our civic engagement and destroy human beings. And we see that overseas. Um, I will say that what's interesting and, and particularly heartbreaking is that we see many, many uh, clients from African nations and race is not something that they are used to being discriminated against or hated for, or it's incredibly shocking that the color of someone's skin could cause such a reaction in this country. Um, and so when they come to this country for refuge, they have to confront racism and they have to confront, you know, the fear of, of living in this country. And, and it is really confusing and really harmful to, um, 
their recovery uh, from torture and trauma and from their, their acculturation and building a new life here in America is something they're just not, um, not used to having to confront often in their home countries. So the next one, types of torture. I, I'm not going to go through all this, but it, you know, many people in the, Amer in the United States think of torture as waterboarding or something they've seen in the movies. And really torture, as I mentioned, can come in many forms. Um, relating to intersectionality, the vast majority of our female clients have been sexually tortured. Um, it is something that is done to destroy female human beings. Um, and to um, and it is particularly difficult to to confront uh, through counseling. Um, and so, it, torture. We've talked about some of the psychological um, after effects from violence. Same with torture. PTSD is the number one thing that we see: anxiety, depression, somatic pain, uh, feeling pain throughout your body, uh, and suicidality is a very, very common. But there are also a variety of um, physical ailments too, just chronic pain from being restrained, being beaten, um, balance and mobility problems from being confined in small spaces or, or beaten on the soles of your feet, uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, so there's a whole, it's the whole human being. It's uh, physical and mental all together. And at CBT, we try to address all of those, those things. Um, the triple trauma paradigm is something we talk about in refugee health. And at CBT, we work with refugees and asylum seekers. So there is the pre-flight, the torture experience in their country, which I spoke about a little bit. The flight is being fleeing for your life, living in a refugee camp, doing whatever you can do to survive and to find food and to find safety. Post-flight is what we just discussed. How are, how are people dealing here in the United States? Um, there's a whole set of additional stressors that come from acculturation, particularly in this time. So the prevalence of torture here in Georgia, it's much higher than you might think. Um, they, we have about 75,000 refugees who've been welcomed to Georgia and studies show 44% are likely to have experienced some sort of torture or severe trauma. Uh, so there are quite a few individuals here in Georgia who have had that background. And so finally, I, we often will say that torture is a hidden problem, uh, just like all violence, sexual violence, sexual exploitation. People are reluctant to come forward, uh, particularly so for people who don't trust their authorities back at home and probably don't trust the authorities here either. Um, and there's a tremendous lack of access to care here in Georgia, particularly for immigrants, um, particularly uh, mental health care that takes into account the cultural background and the trauma is very, very lacking. So that's something at CBT we're trying to, to work on. Uh, so that's, that's what I have here and, and thank you very much. Thank you, Darlene. Very important for us to remember how, how much, so much of trauma and including torture is hidden and really exists all around us. What we're seeing happening this week and this weekend is, is really a, an active demonstration of trauma, communal and individual trauma, and really important for us to remember that it exists around us all the time. Um, we'll turn now to Tamar. Hi. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, as mentioned, it really is extremely relevant right now to have this panel. We're in a really difficult moment for our country. Um, there's very serious issues that I think we need to take stock of and address, but there's also a lot of trauma, both on an individual level as well as on a collective level. And I also just want to say that my heart really goes out particular to the families that are grieving and the communities that are grieving right now. I just want to recognize that. So um, I'm the Associate Director of the Human Rights Clinic at the University of Miami School of Law, where we work on advancing gender justice and social and economic rights, both in the United States as well as globally. One particular area of focus for us is addressing gender-based violence. And we define that to include both domestic violence amongst intimate partners, as well as sexual assault, as both are products of gender bias. Gender-based violence is really serious and, and really um, 
it's, it's hidden, but it's also a really huge issue, both globally and in the US. Just a few statistics to give context. According to the United Nations, one in three women worldwide experience physical and or sexual violence in their lives. According to the Department of Justice, one in three women die per day as a result of domestic violence. And for every woman killed, nine more are critically injured. And according to the CDC, nearly one in five women in the US has been raped. Moreover, violence is compounded by intersecting forms of discrimination. So this includes race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, all of that. Um, and it's really a, a fundamental um, principle of intersectionality that you need to look across the different forms of identity to really understand the trauma and the violence. Um, our work has focused on engaging with the justice system. Now, the justice system is really only one component of a comprehensive response to gender-based violence. Like you need health systems, you need um, social services, there's so many other things that you need. And in many cases, you don't want to turn to the justice system at all. Nonetheless, to have an effective justice system is important. Women rely on it to interrupt violence. And it is the state's responsibility. It's actually a human rights obligation to ensure that it is effective. In fact, domestic violence calls comprise the largest category of calls received by police. And oftentimes police don't really know how to handle them. They're like the least prestigious work for police and also maybe the most dangerous. Um, and all too often the justice system fails women and can be a source of further trauma and further violation of rights. According to the National Domestic um, Violence Hotline Survey, over half of survivors feared that calling the police would actually make their situation worse. And of the um, participants that called the police, 43% uh, uh, noted that they experienced discrimination. And this is both on the basis of gender, about half, as well as with combination with other factors. And I also want to share the story of Jessica Lenahan, who is one of our clients with the Human Rights Clinic, who works closely with my colleague, Carrie Benninger Lopez. Um, her story is really a case in point. Jessica experienced a horrific tra um, tragedy. We've been very privileged to be able to advocate with her. She's a Latina, a Native American woman who lived in a predominantly white town of Castle Rock, Colorado and worked as a janitor there. Her estranged husband abducted their three daughters in violation of a restraining order. Jessica contacted the police throughout the night, but they did nothing. In fact, they called her ridiculous and they even chided her for wasting their time and spent their time like searching after a lost dog during that night. This is despite a restraining order that specifically called for mandatory arrest for violation. Her husband eventually arrived at the police station at 3.30 in the morning. He opened fire with a gun purchased that night. He was killed by the police after a shootout and the bodies of their three daughters were found in his truck. So really a heartbreaking story. Um, but Jessica demanded justice and she sued the police for an action. And her case went all the way to Supreme Court. And you may have heard of her case. It's called Castle Rock v. Gonzalez. Um, and her case is actually featured in a recent Broadway play, What the Constitution Means to Me, where you really grapple with our different rights in the Constitution, and what we want it to mean, and what they should mean. However, the Supreme Court decision unfortunately held that no rights were violated, as there is no constitutional right to enforcement of a restraining order. Writing for the court, Justice Scalia, in a strange twist for those of you that know Justice Scalia, dismissed the plain language of the Colorado statute and challenged the presumption of, quote, a personal entitlement to something as vague and novel as enforcement of restraining orders. However, Jessica's story does not end there. Unwilling to let injustice rest and declaring that everyone's got a boss, Jessica took her case to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is an international body that um, is part of the Inter-American um, Inter Human Rights System. And it can accept petitions when, there's, um, uh, when uh, there's exhaustion of domestic remedies, it can hold hearings, and it can issue recommendations. In a landmark decision, the commission concluded that the U.S. failed to act with due diligence to protect Jessica and her daughters, violating rights to non-discrimination, equal protection, and life. The commission called for investigation reparations for Jessica, but also on a systemic level, it called for updated policies and programs. And then it sparked a movement for reform, with 30 municipalities adopting resolutions on freedom from domestic violence as a basic human right throughout the U.S. And it, at the national level, this was also taken up with advocates working with the Department of Justice, who proceeded to conduct investigations into the law enforcement response to gender-based violence. And then they, in 2015, released guidance on identifying and preventing gender bias in law enforcement, response to sexual assault and domestic violence. And then the following year, they gave nearly 10 million in grants to police departments and experts to implement the guidance. And the guidance in it discusses the need to treat survivors with respect and for use of trauma-informed interviewing techniques. So you may ask, what is trauma-informed 
care, what does this mean? What is a trauma-informed approach? What, is, what would, should that mean for the justice system? So just to back up and first define trauma. So trauma is an experience that exceeds a person's capacity for coping. It overwhelms the ordinary systems that give people a sense of control, connection, and meaning. And according to the US Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, a trauma-informed approach should recognize symptoms of trauma, pathways to recovery, and the widespread impact of trauma. It then needs to integrate this knowledge into policies and practices. And first and foremost, it needs to seek to avoid re-traumatization, which unfortunately happens too often with our justice system. Um, there are a few key principles to a trauma-informed approach, and I'll name a few that to me seem really important and welcome anyone from the panelists if you wanna expand on that. It has to be survivor-centered, addressing people with respect and dignity. It should focus on safety and the immediate needs of survivors. And it should seek to reinstate a sense of control of agency, so choice and voice are really important, and it should integrate peace, peer support. It also should provide attention to culture, history, and intersecting forms of discrimination. And here it's important to recognize that trauma, as we said, is not just on an individual level, there's also historic trauma that can be passed from one generation to another. Victims of domestic violence may become abusers themselves. In the US, we're still struggling with the lingering effects of slavery. And there may also be a genetic component. In 2015, a research team at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital found that transmission of trauma occurred in children of Holocaust survivors, and then noted the impact on a stress regulation gene not observed among control groups. So this is a new area of study that's developing that there might be um, actually genetic impact in trauma mm -hmm. passed down from generations. Um, at the Human Rights Clinic, we're now in the process of developing several resources with regards to law enforcement response to gender-based violence. And um, we're developing a human rights framework that can be used for analyzing policies and practices. And two key principles will be taking a trauma-informed approach and recognizing intersectionality. We're also working with partners on three case studies using this framework, exploring challenges and good practices in the US, Canada, and Brazil. And we've also brought together all the Department of Justice grantees for a convening and for reflections was pre-COVID. We can still do convenings in person and we'll be publishing a report from this meeting very soon. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to sharing more with you during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Tamara, especially for sharing a few of those key principles of trauma-informed care. There are others that we can discuss in more detail and, and also for raising the question of international mechanisms for human rights and, and bringing those frameworks into our conversation. We'll turn now to Jennifer Swain, the Executive Director of YouthSpark. Jennifer? Um, thank you all for being with us today and um, holding yourselves while we all navigate um, our current realities. And um, thank you to the panelists and uh, for the National Center for allowing us to be able to have a conversation. And as much as the presenters and panelists who you know spoke before me have talked about it, I think one thing that's really key here and that we do recognize is that trauma is a very long continuum. And that you know trauma happens in community and we have to recognize that healing happens in community as well and so from the lens of what we do at youth spark and our center inside of the fulton county juvenile court i think it brings about a really public and private unique model to be able to understand the trauma that's happening but then also create systemic change working with the youth serving system and so the work that we do is primarily associated around exploitation, abuse, and neglect. And being able to provide services really have to, we have to kind of use that framework of, of the trauma and you know what has happened to them and to be able to meet them where they are. And I really like Tamar bringing up the five principles of trauma-informed care. And I'm gonna roll through these slides as well, but we can always you know, be able to do this. But from the lens in which we do things, we definitely, I um, want to define what we see as our problem at Youth Spark. <laughs> um, I think everyone here, and I really appreciate the lineup of panelists because we all sort of come from a different background and we're able to see how it all intersects and how we have to have one larger community-based response for us all to be able to have a bigger collective impact. Um, and what we do is at Youth Spark, we have historically um, tackled the issue of child sex trafficking and the commercial sexual exploitation of young people. Um, if you've been just familiar with the movement at all, we've been able to understand and see the, the journey of this movement over the last 20 years and how even here in Georgia, we've been able to take um, tremendous strides in how we identify victims, but we've found ourselves at the top of the hill recognizing that 
there's so many different ways and aspects that we should be protecting kids against this. And it's not just about saving the kids and the girls as we say it, but it's about also holding the adults who do this. And when I talk about trauma being something that happens in community, the healing needs to be the same way because oftentimes when people begin to talk about trauma and child trafficking and the sexual exploitation of children, they want to solely focus on the, the story of the victim. And in order for us to really begin to move that needle, we have to not only address the needs of the victims in a trauma-informed practice, but also discuss what systems are needed and laws needed to be able to create a space where men don't grow up to become uh, abusers and exploiters. Um, one of the things that is most something that we identify with is using trauma-informed language. Um, and so we don't use words like prostitute and child prostitute because we recognize that children are exploited. Children are um, sold for sex in adult markets. It is not something that they seek out themselves. Um, and one thing that I find to be incredibly important is that when we're sometimes advocating for this and, and children are in spaces where they can be identified, such as health systems, and we know that they are there to check out um, all of the, the physical health ailments, but how do you begin to see past the, the, the mental, the physical health and see the effects of what's happening mentally to them? You know, some of the actual terms and phrases here, these are all, I think, just key indicators of the bigger issue of trauma. Uh, you can't really pull out one of these. And so in practice, we've always sort of said, if you have one or more of these or two or more of these, we train uh, so youth serving providers, such as mandatory reporters, teachers, probation officers, judges, we train them all to sort of look for these indicators. But what we have to recognize is that sometimes you can't pinpoint trauma in this way. You can't pinpoint the event or the experience because it happens, the abuse that we see happens on this larger continuum. And so it is always important that we talk about the red flags of the victim, but we also have to talk about the bigger systemic issue here that sometimes children and women, we are forced to almost stand up and advocate for ourselves in, in, in the lines of the abuse, which in itself can be equally traumatizing. Uh, we also have to prove that uh, that this is something that happened to the kid versus an adult making a decision. And I think one of the uh, primary um, barriers of this is that we don't spend enough time talking about the demand for paid sex, which actually fuels this problem. And so it's critically important that I always bring forth, especially when we're talking about gender-based violence, we cannot simply take an approach in where we are healing our way out of this problem. We cannot take the approach and, and, and allow social services in the medical field. Uh, we, can, we have some of the best ser services here in Georgia available for kids, some really unique models. But until we're able to ad address the gender-based uh, approaches to being able to do this, then sometimes we have to be able to um, have the other side of that coin, that conversation as to why we're actually here. Um, we can go to the next slide, and I also just want to point out when we're talking about demand, this does not mean just those people who are solely focused on purchasing sex from minors in that uh, pedophile range. It talks about the scope of people who knowingly or unknowingly purchase sex from adolescents here in Georgia. Sometimes people refuse to acknowledge that they want something young. They don't want to acknowledge you know knowing their age and they want to sort of remain willfully ignorant but i think that's part of the problem that contributes to young kids getting caught up in the adult market or people actually separating responses so that we are responding to those adults who did this mm -hmm. and not the kids who got caught up in that um, and we'll move along to the next slide here as, and, and as we do that i also just want to talk about what community-based demand reduction looks like as well as community-based informed uh, trauma, especially when we work in partnership with court partners as well. Um, none of all of the kids who come to us really come to us because they're in happy homes. And last year, 45% um, of the kids that came into Youth Spark, they uh, reported family or in-home conflict, 51% reported uh, education disconnected. And out of that, 30% of those kids had already experienced or was coping with some trauma exposure from physical or sexual abuse. If that does not really show the way that we have to have an intersecting approach to be able to serve these kids, then we really will be setting ourselves up for isolation. Um, one thing that people often talk about is, you know, sort of 
do we just go arrest the bad guys? And is, is this separate from prostitution? Is the strip club industry a part of the problem or against the problem? How do the adults uh, begin to kind of push uh, whose responsibility it is and who we all hold accountable? But I think we all hold ourselves accountable. And it's not just you know law enforcement, it's not just social services, it's not just the school system. It's an individual and a collective approach because you know youth are caught up in that adult um, in that adult market. Um, as the conversation you see there, that's a real live conversation um, on uh, that we've had with buyers. You can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dabney. And one of the things I think that, as much as I think all of us want to talk about the trauma that our kids face and you know the effects of gender-based violence, I think it's important it's important that we sit with the uncomfortable topics because the one thing that I scream from the rooftops is that if nobody wanted to buy sex, then nobody could sell it. Not even the kids themselves, not even the adults who are trying to pimp them out. And so we have to dig down really to find out what is it that's happening and how do we attack those who are buying sex from our kids, whether they're doing it knowingly or unknowingly. And where does that come from? Not my job to go down that road with the buyers. But I think it's important for us to look at it as a public health issue and recognizing that there are some buyers who do this once or twice. There are some buyers that on occasion, they do this two to five times. Um, but then it's, it's this special pocket that we really need to be looking at, the high frequency buyers. And they make up the bulk of all the cases of those that are sold. And I think for us, the question becomes not just what types of trauma-informed care is necessary for us to have that conversation and be inclusive of that. But how do we begin to address that separate and apart from the healing of the victim? And, and we'll move on from that because um, it's not just about uh, research and education, but it's about community-based accountability and also demanding that there's investigation and high-value arrest. Oftentimes our kids come in and they face these traumas and there is no accountability for them. They don't know what happened to, you know, to the person who did this to them. They've been taught to kind of move along in this process and that they can still be whole, happy adults, in which they really can. But there are certain solutions that I think that, that we have to take as a community and as partners together. And as I just sort of wrap up my statements here, we, we oftentimes hold our kids in our hearts and we oftentimes want to make sure that we are giving them what they need. But one of the things that I recognize that we have to begin to do is to stop treating the individual and really treat the family and treat the community. And I think that that holds true now more so than ever before as we look at what's happening over the weekend and it is impossible for our kids and our young people to continue to see violence and disproportionately have people who look like them die or seemingly have less value, it is uncomfortable for them to see that and not see the system or our community step in and provide a solution and acknowledge um, that, that there was some wrong in there. And that I think is a part of the true trauma-informed care that we all should be participating in right now, but then giving to our community. Thank you so much, Jennifer, so powerful. And I really appreciate you bringing in the idea of healing and community-based healing. And that's something that I think we all need and um, we all have our traumas and our community traumas and we do need to find ways forward. So thank you for, for bringing that to us. We'll move on to our final panelist now, Charnel Miles. Thank you for um, having me and um, especially to the, the Center for holding this forum, um, what better time than now, um, especially given the, you know, the past week or weeks, um, particularly this weekend, and just for allowing us to, to hold some space um, to be able to recognize and, um, Dabney, as you said, you know, say the names of those who were um, unjustly killed. Um, and so for our agency, which is Joyous Beginnings, I just want to talk a little bit about what we do. Um, and in particular, um, our nonprofit side of the agency, which really focuses on um, working from a generational perspective, we say a two-gen perspective, 
um, and also really focusing on creative ways to help our young girls heal, um, in particular girls of color. Um, so within Joyous Beginnings, we really focus on trauma um, exclusively, working with not only youth, but also their families. Um, I kind of laugh because oftentimes when families come into the office and a parent is bringing a child in, the parent is on their way to walk out the door, and I'm like, stop. <laughs> this is just not about the child. This is not a babysitting service. Um, but this is about the family and the family has to do the work to really move towards um, healing. So a few areas of trauma that we really focus on, um, avert physical and sexual abuse, um, psychological abuse, deprivation of resources, which a lot of times we see families um, just depleted of resources. Um, as a direct result of some generational or historical trauma, um, as well as treatment of girls and, and women as uh, commodities or through sex trafficking. Um, we primarily focus on, again, the family, that unit. Um, you know, years ago, we started looking at um, how do you really effectively build a two-generational approach and what does that mean? And oftentimes, as you all may know, we see a lot of families who that child is identified as the client. However, that family is really holding on to so much trauma um, that's just permeating throughout everyone who lives in that space or, or that home. Um, and you see so many shared symptoms, like Darlene mentioned, uh, and Keisha mentioned, the, the PTSD, the depression, um, other, you know, uh, anxiety. So just all types of um, uh, behavioral issues that are coming out of that. But also really focusing on community. Um, I will share for me growing up, I experienced community-based trauma, right, which could have left, sent me left or sent me right. Um, thankfully, I had some protective factors in there that acted as buffers. Um, but community-based trauma, I don't think we're having enough conversation. I think is more prominent now, given where we are. But historically, we really weren't having enough conversation about community -based trauma and really how that's impacting our families. Um, so we're focused on that, uh, that area of trauma. Also, the education setting. Uh, for the past year, being able to work with the urban school boards throughout the U.S. and really having that um, much-needed conversation about and what does equity look like in the face of mental health, uh, in the face of trauma, uh, working with the uh, um, climate and culture mm -hmm. teams throughout the U.S. And them to, number one, not only face some historical inequities that they've had to deal with, but being able to really have some good conversations about how do you support your students and your families around issues of equity. And then the last, um, the last uh, uh, place we're really um, working on this is internationally. And I'll talk more a little bit about that in terms of what our girls are doing or how we are um, providing that space and that opportunity for young girls who have experienced trauma to also um, use their voices internationally to not only learn, but also to serve. So, you know, I, I really thought about um, some of the statistics that's out there, just in terms of trauma. Um, and we know that particularly for girls of color, um, the statistics are alarming. You know, for me, I, I say the, the statistics have been alarming, right? But I think we're just now looking at them in a very different way and becoming creative and really attacking these statistics. Um, to decrease a lot of these numbers. But as someone mentioned, you know, one in three girls will be victims of physical, verbal, or emotional abuse um, in their lifetime within, within the U.S. Um, our girls of color are, you know, six times more likely to be suspended from school 
than their uh, counterparts. And a lot of times when you look at that, it is directly linked to a lot of the trauma that they have experienced um, very early on and other societal factors, how mm -hmm. girls of color um, are being seen as a threat when they are engaging in non-threatening behaviors and treated as such. Um, but then also 60% of black girls will experience sexual abuse even before the age of 18. 60%. So again, you know, we know that the, st the statistics are, are just really alarming. And for us, we wanted to find mm -hmm. that creative mm -hmm. way of not only just working with the girl or, uh, but also providing a generational approach. So through my organization, we have the Social Justice Cafe for Girls, um, which is open to all girls throughout Georgia. Um, and it really provides a safe space for girls and their mothers to address these issues um, through mentorship, through providing uh, mentorship and direction through social justice, um, giving them a lens that they can understand and create their own advocacy, um, as well as international uh, travel and action and completing social impact projects within their own communities. Because again, we want to give them that power back. For so many of them, they have been through, um, I say trauma that can make an adult head spin. Um, and, and for some adults, it's hard to, to really understand. But for the youth that we serve, um, they carry this trauma with them every single day. And it, you know, it can be sexual abuse, it could be physical abuse, it could be community-based violence, but it can also be issues such as bullying. For a lot of our girls, bullying is just as traumatic as some of those other issues that they are dealing with. Um, so again, when, when, when they become a part of our organization, we are first really assessing the need. We look at their ACEs because mm -hmm. we want to know what are the things that they have endured. Mm -hmm. We want to look at the parents' ACEs because again, we mm -hmm. want to really look at generationally what's been going on in this particular family that is still impacting the youth and have a increased you know, chance of impacting a future generation. That's what we want to try to stop. Um, we're also really assessing safety. You know, where are they? Uh, what are they vulnerable to? Are they at risk for, again, being put out of school? Are they at risk for future sexual abuse, community-based violence? Um, are there particular diagnoses that we need to uh, treat or support them in, in getting treated? You know, is there a food issue? Um, we really do a lot of work around food equity. I can tell you since uh, the beginning of COVID-19, every week we've served over 150 meals uh, because we know that when our youth do not eat, we see so many other issues that come along with that. So we're looking at um, safety in a very holistic way and putting resources in place for that family um, that can de decrease their, uh, their risk. Um, also, just calling this thing by name. Um, I tell people we don't sugarcoat anything. We don't do the cookie cutter approach. We are calling it by name. We are saying what it is. Um, no more secrets, even within families. Uh, you know, it, it really being real with what's going on now with our youth. Um, you know, this past weekend, um, I, we had a, a call with our girls and there was just a flood of emotions all over the place. And then we started having some of the parents chime in because then they would get on the line and say, I'm scared, I'm afraid. And for them, um, not only were they seeing the work that their daughters were doing, now we have parents who are brave enough to say, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I need. So really, again, making that connection so that not only the youth moves or the girl moves, but the whole thing is moving towards healing. 
Um, Dr. Charnel, I'm sorry. I hate to interrupt you because you are just touching on some wonderful topics and issues that we really need to delve into deeper. Um, but we are nearing the end of our hour. And so okay. I want to thank you and for your wonderful remarks. I want to thank all six of our panelists. Thank you, Dabney, for being our facilitator. Um, but on behalf of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, we definitely want to thank these panelists who have devoted their time and their love and their efforts toward discussing trauma-informed care relating to gender and intersectionality-based violence. So I want to thank each of you, thank our attendees for participating. We invite you back in two weeks to talk about human rights, HIV, AIDS, and mental health, and homelessness and mental health. And our last series will be homelessness and mental health on June 29th. So we want to thank you all very much. We hope you have a blessed day and stay safe.